Greetings. Appreciate you watching. My name is Rob Whitehead. I'm a licensed architect and an associate professor of architecture at Iowa State University, where I teach building structures, design studio, and design build. This is the first in a series of lectures that introduces the content from the book Structures by Design, Thinking, Making, and Breaking. This book was written to offer an alternative approach to structural design education of architects. One that presents learning opportunities not as a choice between design and technology, but a confluence of them. It's based on a simple idea that structural design is a creative act, and therefore the process by which it's taught and learned should be more akin to a design studio. This approach, which I call thinking, making, breaking, encourages you to take a creative and active approach to learning structural design. As always, when we embark on a process of learning something, we need to think to ourselves, well, why are we interested in the topic? And what is it that we hope to learn from it? And so I start with this particular quote about structure. The idea that structure has this primary, form-defining, volumetric, and expressive role to play in architecture. In other words, if you're interested in things like form, volume, and expression of architecture, which frankly every architect should be, then structures and embracing the idea of structural content should be a big part of what we choose to do. Thinking through these two particular quotes from Eladio Diesti and of course Oviarup, two great engineers talking about the role of form and design and building structures. And when I read these quotes, I think to myself, Starting with structures is what's so important here. We have to start with our aspirations of what the structures could be or should be. And then if we want structures to be a certain way, look a certain way, to integrate with architecture in a particular manner, we need to figure out how architecture and structures are in fact linked. DST suggests that this is through resistance through form. Arup suggests that it's through a synthesis of all these different elements that work together in his case, what he calls total design. So if we bind ourselves to this commitment that the technical aspects of architecture matters, in other words, structures, then we're able to move on from here. But my question at the bottom is, the, I think the most relevant one here, which is how do we achieve this as designers? Structural design is the artful resolution of technical constraints into effective, efficient, and expressive buildings. Like other design disciplines, it relies upon insight and acumen to find creative solutions to architectural problems. Unfortunately, as these graphs show you, at the beginning of projects, when we have the greatest freedom to apply structural influence to architectural design, we're often equipped with the least amount of knowledge. We have to learn to embed design thinking and our technical expertise together. Structures isn't something we want to add in later. And if you look at the statistics here, depending on the overall type of structure. Structures can consist of up to 15 to 30 percent of the overall construction budget. Why would we cede that control or that amount of information, that amount of discipline, to someone else to figure out? Why not consider it earlier? Is it just because we haven't learned to consider structures from a schematic design perspective? Consider Guy Nortonson's sketch for one World Trade Center shown over here on the right. In this, the form, the plan, and the bracing strategy was fundamental to the earliest schematics. So how do we learn to learn this? Is it through a traditional engineering-based method of representation? And I'd argue, of course, no. These diagrams that you're showing here are important diagrams, and they actually do tell us quite a few things about structural behavior. And we will figure out what they mean and how to use these to influence our design choices. But the thing is, we can't start here. So historically then in architectural education, this type of technical knowledge has been a prelude to design experimentation. In other words, you need to learn bending theory before you can learn how to do a framing plan for structures. But when engineering-based information comes first, it never leaves. And as a result, traditional structure classes focus on sizing and selecting of these elements. And so then the competency is based on finding the right answer. Then with little effort aimed at creating or improving a design or a performance. Does the beam work? Yes or no. Is the rebar sized correctly? Yes or no. 
So at its core, it erroneously treats design and technology-based problem solving as separate endeavors. This is an essential and important part of the task, learning these diagrams and being able to size things correctly. But it shouldn't be the first, and it certainly isn't the only obligation. Structural considerations should be generative. So what else, how else could we learn? When structural design is presented primarily as a search for answers that are either right or wrong, designers may mistakenly develop an adversity to experiment or to innovate. This habit leaves them unprepared to deal with the interactive and synergetic nature of a design practice in which an ability to uh, critically integrate structures into designs, and here you see building forms and volumes, lots of different expressions, is an important responsibility of what architects do. My experience as an architect and a professor has taught me that separating structural design from the creative act, or assuming that technically based assessments of a structural proposal can't be creative, are simply wrong assumptions. And so at Iowa State, we've spent a decade of doing these types of hands-on experiments. Our architecture students have thought and made and broken many different types of structures throughout all the years. We learn through lectures and then immediately go and do hands-on learning labs. Through the series of lectures that I'm gonna to present to you, I'll take breaks every once in a while and be able to show you options of labs that you can do, other hands-on experiments. So those images show kind of the fun times and ways that we can learn to have a good time when we're learning about structures, but it's also serious business. We can't just start building anything you want and say, oh, it's a structure, it'll hold up. There's a discipline to it as a building science and we have to respect the discipline. So how do we learn that discipline? And so the reason I titled the book Thinking, Making, and Breaking was a way to get you to start thinking about it as a process not about a product, not about sizing a rebar, but a process of decision making. So in this diagram, you can see that our options narrow as we move from left to right. We start off with the broadest possible schematic choices, and then we start to narrow these things down. We choose what type of structure. We try to figure out how to make it. What's the best way to make or assemble these things? In breaking, this is about assessment. How do we look for what's the compliance of it or the shape of it? And then when we get to the last stage of it, we have to think, well, does this work? Are there other options? Do we remake it? Do we re-break it? And obviously what you see here is there's a feedback loop that comes all the way through between as we think about structures and as we make them and as we break them. Something that's always useful is to think about how this process has been used historically. So sometimes even experts struggle to harmonize the creative and technical aspects of architecture and structures together. For example, most of you probably know the Sydney Opera House. It was in fact quite cumbersome to design and develop and build because there was a discrepancy between its competition award-winning architectural idea and the feasibility of actually structuring and constructing its sail-like forms. So the Opera House's designer, Jorn Jutzen, he had not conferred with an engineer before he had submitted and won the proposal. And so then the project engineers, Arup and Associates, determined that the project couldn't be built as he had designed it. The basic problem was the roof's form didn't transfer its loads properly. Although the roofs looked like shells, they acted like curving beams and they wouldn't work. They would bend or they would break or they would get too thick. So for six years, while the project's foundations were already under construction, Arup's office explored, as you can see over here to the right, 11 different schemes. Eventually, these explorations revealed a system by which each curve would be assigned to the same great circle. They were trying to find a descriptive geometry that would help both mathematically and functionally, and of course, in construction. So they did a repeated fan-like array of 2,400 precast concrete arches and ribs. And so it continued all the way after even Utsun had left the project in 66. And they did these small-scale projects and full construction assemblies to test both the sequencing and staging of the pre-stressing and precast elements. The reason I'm showing you this is because here's this design that was an innovative design that was trying to find a physical form. And they knew that they had to try to meet the challenges of this particular form. 
But because the structure was not consulted earlier, because it wasn't integrated in the overall thinking of it, look at the effort that they had to make in order to resolve it. So in this case, there's innovation in the modeling of it. The physical models informed both the testing and the construction. Arup called this an adventure in building. It was completed 16 years after it started. This process is difficult. Interesting innovations in structural design and documentation and analysis emerged out of the process. If the structural form had matched the forces, many of these things would have gone away. And so you may think, well, that's just an anomalous story. But it wasn't. This is a really frequent idea whenever structures and innovation and design match up. 500 years earlier, in 1436, Filippo Brunelleschi was selected in a design competition to design and construct the uniquely shaped dome over the Cathedral Duomo in Florence, Italy. It was higher and wider than any dome that had ever been built. The octagonal base had fixed the design proportions of the dome 150 years earlier. You can see the, pr the proposal here in the wooden model, but no one could actually figure out how to build a dome that matched the geometry of the base. Now, if you think about it, in 1436, modern scientific-based understanding of structural material behavior, it was still centuries away, and the project had no precedent to draw upon. Brunelleschi proposed an ingenious double shell. It allowed the outer shell to meet the geometric design standards, but then an inner shell that was formed that could better align with the more apt structural form. There were large chains that were embedded within the dome's perimeter that resisted a lot of the outward thrust. No one had ever constructed a dome like this without a supporting timber frame below. This dome's height made it, so scaffolding was in fact impossible. So Brunelleschi had to invent not just new ways of structuring this, but new, new ways of constructing it as it rose. He studied and tested and documented construction problems using drawing, physical models, and prototypes. Just as Arup did, a half a millennia later, the solution worked admirably. Still the largest masonry dome in the world. We can learn from Arup and Brunelleschi by looking at how they developed their work particularly this integration between structural technology and architecture. Their problems were so vexing that they used every means available to them, from analog to, at least in Arup's case, algorithms. They created multiple representations, or models, of their project to test their decision's validity. They learned from testing to improve, to innovate, and then to refine their work. The takeaway from this is how they solve the problems and what they revealed through their efforts is exemplary. And so then the core concepts of the book, and in fact this chapter, are what follows. One, matching architectural forms to materials based on structural principles makes everything easier. Certainly this is one of the takeaways from Sydney Opera House. Because design requires earnest, industrious, and creative efforts, and of course a diverse set of tools to do it, we have to make. Learning what models to make and how to make is, of course, the next important decision. Making mistakes is part of a healthy design process. Engineering, in a way, is about repeated failure. Ideas are improved through testing. So if you learn to embrace the productive role of failures when breaking your work, more will be revealed when you do that. And of course, as we've learned through design, you have to repeat as necessary. Breaking helps you rethink, and rethinking helps you remake. So the first lesson then about why think. Structural ideas must be purposeful. Development of forms without intent is aimless. A well-informed, fluid, problem-solving mindset allows for creative and responsive solutions to be quickly considered. So instead of thinking about a diagram first, or just simply making whatever models come to mind, a more effective way to learn structural design is to consider the primary mechanisms by which structures provide resistance, and then to try to explore the patterns by which this resistance is provided. Fortunately, there are discernible patterns in how structures resist forces that's related to both the form and the materials. And these patterns, of course, have clear architectural implications. You can see different ways that these can be classified and in all of these, you can see how one particular idea can then be evolved and changed into different types of ways that resistance can be provided.
We can then start to classify and differentiate structures from each other. So the book is then based in different sections of how structural resistance is provided. Form, section, vector, surface, and frame. Architectural design is about creating prototypes or models to test our proposals and responsiveness. Because architects don't make buildings, mostly, we make abstracted or simplified representations of buildings. We need to be vigilant about our tools and what simulations they produce. Basically, what are we trying to learn and then what tools do we use to try to see whether that's going to work or not? Once we understand that different structural systems and elements resist and transfer loads in particular ways, and that these ways suggest certain formal and material qualities that correspond with architectural, spatial, experiential considerations, we can then better develop our proposals. We see Buckminster Fuller's class at Black Mountain College doing their experiments for a deployable and collapsible space frame structure. In this, they were trying to test how easily it could be moved, how quickly it could be built, how much space it could enclose, and how strong it was. And of course, we also see that this isn't just about doing things uh, by hand and doing things in an analog way. Our structural design process involves embracing new technologies, digital design, computation, algorithms. And in doing so, it's still making, of course. We're still seeing what new means of construction we can do. Tools can become obsolete, particularly if the feedback loops are prolonged or if the methods of their use are cumbersome, or in fact, if they're fraught with potential inaccuracy. Always use the right tool for the right job. What we find when we look at structures and structural design is that there's not one tool, there's not one model, there's not one way to then design, develop, and test building structures. In fact, it takes quite a few different tools that work simultaneously. We see here in Trojas process here for the uh, Club Tacarina in 55, that he used a process that went from sketching to elevations, to then sketching on top of the elevations and plan, to then a physical model of the shell. Then the physical model of the shell was also translated into a series of painstaking calculations in that he's looking for different variations of how much the shell might deflect at particular points. So the reason I'm showing this is, of course, because all of these ways of representing the project are about design and analysis. They're about a thinking and making and breaking process. So when you think about the tools that you use, I want you to consider that they have to be a broad range of tools. What you want to do is try to select a tool that is good with the simulation or the model that you're trying to create. And try to create this feedback loop between what's a sketch be able to show us, what can an elevation show us, what does a physical model show us. Then we're able to make significant progress. These things that we make then are called models. And we use the word model quite a bit in architectural design studio, but there are actually different ways of making models that have different uses for us when we start to think about incorporating structural design considerations. Some of these models are, can be called representational models. Representational models are not meant for structural testing. And this is a lot of what we'll see in an architectural design studio. We see Aero Saarinen's office working on the TWA model in 57. Now, there were, in fact, structural implications of the shape of the shell that he was working on, but at the same time, this was just meant to represent the overall amount of space. There are other models that be able to show the building form, but are better linked to the structural performance. These are called generative models. A generative model ideally can show the ideal geometry. You can see Fry Otto's experiments with soap bubbles. There's quite a few different examples of this. This one's from 61. He's looking for the perfectly tensioned surface. And so he'd create this formwork. He'd dip it in a soap bubble solution and take a picture. And in doing so, then he'd try to translate that ideal tension surface into something that could be used for a membrane. Both of these things are trying to connect thinking to making. So when you think about what architectural form you're going to do, Think about what its role is in trying to tell you how it might behave as a structure. There are educational models as well. Educational models are designed to demonstrate some type of a learning. 
Oftentimes, and I use these for simplified representations, you see the great Mola structural kit. Just with two simple drawings, you can see the difference between how a truss works, how it puts things in compression and bending, how it looks at pins and how forces move through that. This educational model is super simplified when it's great because it's hands-on learning. When we do that, either by building things that we break or standing on things, what we find is that by breaking these things, we reveal certain hidden behaviors. It's a lot easier to see bending when something deflects than it is to go through a formula that shows the amount of bending and where bending is at its maximum. The other thing I've realized about educational models is in building them and testing them, it helps to diminish the fear of failure. We can confirm the certain principles that we think. In other words, you see the shell designs down below. Those were both uh, confirming that the thickness of that particular shell would be able to handle that load over that particular span. In doing so, we learn that through haptic learning, hands-on learning, using our bodies. And when we use our bodies, we really embed that learning quite a bit. All of these ways of learning through educational models involve a hands-on approach. So why are we also breaking? So we've got thinking and we understand the importance of thinking. We've got making and we understand the importance of the different models and how we use those models. Why does breaking help us so much? We can anticipate how certain failures may occur, whether through the wrong form, and this can be either through historical precedent analysis or just an understanding principles of structure. But the idea that all models are wrong and some are more useful presents us with the idea that learning about something through breaking it gives us limits. It helps us actually understand whether an object conforms or doesn't conform. And if it doesn't, what makes it so that it doesn't work? So failures, in my opinion, are only a problem if they're unexpected. Evaluations, in other words, what we're learning by breaking here, are intended to reveal more than just a compliance. If all we were going for was compliance, then things could be overstructured. And if what we're looking for is in fact a more ideal or efficient solution, then what we're looking for is that edge where we're not just overstructuring things. There's two ways of thinking about the breaking process. Historically, it's been done through theory, which is called mathematical evaluation, in which some person would actually think through the mathematical solution of it, or experimentation, testing and prototypes, or as what we've evolved into now, both. Which brings us to the next type of model, confirmative models. Oftentimes these are models in which there's something about the calculation that we wanna to test to make sure that it's correct. Usually there's some type of innovation or experiment here. We're trying to build knowledge. So when we break beams or when we test shells, what we're looking for is we're trying to understand something about what kind of change we've made to this beam or what kind of change we've made to this shell that we're trying to confirm the behavior of. So you make a hypothesis, of course, then you test these things and you generate and you collect the data. You're trying to confirm then what the calculations anticipated would happen here. And sometimes, especially with Taroha's uh, shell over here, you're trying to understand theoretical behavior. There are some types of structures that are indeterminate that we mostly would have to guess at through calculation. And so when we're doing that, we're trying to narrow this gap between the theory and the experiment. So the experiment helps with the theory of the mathematics. Excitingly, of course, with new computer algorithms, we're able to get towards what we call optimizing models. These optimizing models are really fantastic, of course, because they can be both generative and confirmative. In this, and I'm sure hopefully you have some experience with these, or at least you're familiar with them, we set up certain parameters, so a parametric design. This parametric design has different types of components. These components, then, we can set different sizes and spacing and optimize the performance. So the different trusses that you're looking at here, you see the different points in there. Those are different nodes. By putting this through a parametric model, we can then figure out either how closely those are spaced, how far away those are spaced, how thick those elements are, how much weight is on there. 
Then we get certain readouts, which you see over here on the side of it. Those readouts show us the internal stress that's happening within each one of those units, suggest whether that stress is compression or tension. And even then we can start to compare how much overall mass, meaning how much structural weight it takes to resist this. And in this case, it's looking at the displacement, how much with that much weight, how much it then displaces and deflects. In doing so, it generates a series of options for us to look at and also gives us a confirmation right away. And if we're looking at that and say, oh, there's too much mass, because we've set it up parametrically, we can change that parameter and reduce the mass. In order to do that work though, it doesn't just magically happen. It's always garbage in, garbage out, especially with algorithms. And what I really like about when we get into optimization is it helps us actually to think through it, enhances our ability then to think, make, and break. So here's a different variation from what I had showed you earlier. When you try to set up a decision tree or a problem map, because you can't do optimized design or an algorithm without actually thinking through what these different categories are going to be. So one of the goals of this book is to help designers explore ways to design with a rigor of quantitative data and physical form and materiality without diminishing or ignoring the qualitative factors. The ultimate goal is to be able to think critically about the topics using a diversity of tools in a feedback loop. So the thinking and the making and the breaking is part of this feedback loop. And if we want to then do an optimized tool, here you can see that you have certain design options or realms. From those design options, in this case, I'm starting the far left and say, well, why trusses? Now that's a big decision in and of itself. Why trusses? And then from that, there's different categories of trusses. You could select one of those types of trusses, figure out then how you can integrate architectural and structural principles into it, decide what types of tools for design and development and testing you want to use. Are you going to use a historic precedent or a behavioral confirmative model or just a representational model? Or are you going to develop an analytical model? If you choose the analytical model, Going forward then, what are your parameters? What are you trying to test from this? Depth, form, number of panels to the truss. From there, you can assemble all these parameters together and calculate. You find out a certain amount of data. You take that data all the way over and you find out, is this performing the way I want it to? And if it doesn't, and it probably won't by the way, then you have to not just think, make and break, but you have to repeat. You take that performance data and you either load that back in and say, is trust is the right choice? And you start the whole loop over and over again. Certain software tools or even ways of drawing this are ways of shortening this feedback loop. In doing so, you can manage multiple parameters as we've been talking about, provide some sort of analytical data. And so when we're able to take visual and computational work together, we can start to easily see what the implications are for structural form and stress. Gina Ripple's Karumba simulations here show us that by changing the geometry, we're able to locate where we see either the largest amounts of stress in these different things, what type of stress is in that, and then what it might take either to make those elements thicker or bigger, or how we might change the geometry to reduce the amount of stress in those particular locations. And of course, over here, nearly a, a century before, with Wolf's drawings of graphic statics. Graphic statics is another way of looking at the internal forces within, in this case, trusses. In that, the graphic statics are able to uh, resolve through the geometry how much stress is in each particular element. This then can be generative because the actual geometry of the form is related to how much stress is within each piece. So at the end of this, I just simply want you to consider this idea. Process of designing structures should be aspirational and creative. Well-designed structures should give an integrity to these architectural forms. Ideally, we're improving building performance, doing more than just standing, strengthening the experiences, the unique qualities that architecture can bring, and amplifying the beauty of order. Architectural qualities improve because of these structural encumbrances, not in spite of them. And again, thanks for your time. If you want more information, I always have more information. Keep your eye out for this channel for additional lectures.
appreciate it.